This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Sue Fishkoff uh, is, uh, is very well known. She's the national correspondent for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, and she is also a longtime reporter uh, for the Jerusalem Post. Uh, and as I said a moment ago, she's the author of this very well-known and critically acclaimed book, The Rebbe's Army, Inside the World of Chabad Lubavitch. Uh, and that's published by Schocken, which is, of course, one of the great, great uh, Jewish publishing houses. And she also freelances for a variety of Jewish publications, including The Forward, uh, Hadassah, uh, London Jewish Chronicle, and Reform Judaism. Please welcome now um, Sue Fishkoff, who is going to talk on Kosher Nation, why more and more of America's food answers to higher authority. I've been a reporter in the Jewish media for 20 years. I live in Oakland, California now. And my beat is Jewish identity, new forms of Jewish expression, particularly how younger Jews are expressing their Jewish identity in this country. A few years ago, when I started researching this book, as I was traveling around the country doing my other reporting, I would ask the Jews that I met for their stories about Kashrut. Doesn't matter how secular you are, how liberal you are, every Jew has their own kosher story from their family, from their grandparents, some way, some unusual way that their family practiced the Jewish diet. I mean, you, you could have one family would say we would have shrimp cocktail, but obviously not pork. And the other family say, you know, this is okay and that's not okay. Um, there was one young woman who works for a Jewish organization in New York who grew up in a kosher home, and her parents would allow her, when she was a teenager, to call out for pizza with her friends, but only in the basement. That was like the non-kosher room that was separated. It's interesting, you would draw, draw red lines in your family and have a Jewish conversation about Jewish dietary practice, even as you were stretching the rules. The most interesting story of that nature that I came across was just a few weeks ago as I was presenting my book to a Lion of Judah group in Ventura, California. And one of the older women there said when she was growing up, I think it was in the 40s, her house was a kosher home, her, her parents' home, and they would have separate, obviously, dairy and meat dishes in the kitchen. And like some homes in those years, and today, I dare say, they had a cupboard for the trafe dishes when they would bring in Chinese food. But what was very interesting about this family was they would put into the trafe cupboard only chipped glasses and cracked dishes. Now think about that. So that when they were eating non-kosher food on it, it was as if they were chipping away at their Jewish identity and they would talk about it as a family. What does it mean? I found that just fascinating. It, there, there's something in the way we're brought up as Jews that causes us to think about our food choices in a variety of ways. Now, if I had told my grandmother, Grandma Bell, who came from Russia when she was a baby in 1906, if I had told her that a hundred years hence, kosher food would be the hottest food trend in America, she would have laughed. She would have said, what do you mean? A hundred years from now, there are going to be so many Jews in America that they're all going to be eating kosher food? She had no way of knowing, nobody had any way of knowing, that whereas even just a generation ago, kosher food was the province of this country's small minority of observant Jews, today kosher food is the largest and fastest growing segment of the American food industry. 40% of the food for sale in the American supermarket is kosher certified. And you can be sure that it's mostly non-Jews who are buying it. How did that happen? 
Let me take you all back to 1972, the first time a very famous television commercial aired on American TV, the, kosher na the Hebrew National Kosher Hot Dog Commercial. Um, many of you in this room know it. I think they started repeating it. You can surely watch it on YouTube, both the original 1972 and the redone version. Uncle Sam, dressed in his full regalia, is about to bite into a hot dog when a voice comes down from heaven and says, Oy va voy, don't bite into that hot dog. You know the hazarai they put in hot dogs and the chemicals and the additives and the meat byproducts. And Uncle Sam's face falls. But, says the heavenly voice, don't worry. This is a Hebrew national kosher hot dog, and we answer to a higher authority. We answer to a higher authority has now entered the American lexicon, and 40 years after that TV commercial first aired, the message still resonates. The overwhelming majority of Americans, not Jews, every Ameri Americans believe that kosher food is safer, healthier, more pure and of higher quality than non-kosher food, and they're willing to pay more for it. How did that happen? Uh, most, most of the people who buy kosher food in this America, are, in, in this country, are not aware that they're buying kosher certified food. They're picking up their Heinz ketchup, their Tropicana orange juice, their Oreo cookies, and they're not looking for the kosher label. That's where the, most of the $200 billion in annual sales in kosher food comes from, and that's out of a $500 billion um, domestic food industry. But there are, are about 12 to 13 million regular kosher consumers, and those are the people who look for the kosher label, 12 to 13 million of them. Only about 1 million Jews in this country keep kosher. So who are the rest of the people buying the kosher food? Some of them are non-observant Jews who look for kosher food at holidays, most specifically Passover. Jews who don't keep kosher the rest of the year will line up every March, beginning of April, depending on the year, and buy their kosher for Passover matzah and their wine and the gefilte fish and the food they don't eat the rest of the year. Uh, food producers who make food for the Jewish ethnic market traditionally do 50% of their business in the two weeks right around Passover. So that's some of the people buying kosher food. But most of the regular kosher consumers are people who believe the we answer to a higher authority promise. 62% of regular kosher consumers buy kosher food because they believe it's healthier. More than half buy it because they believe it's safer. In a country where 5,000 people every year die from food tainted, tainted food, foodborne illnesses, Many Americans find comfort in knowing that an extra pair of eyes, religious eyes, are watching the food manufacturing process. So we have this whole perception that kosher food is better. I stood in a Safeway store when I was researching my book, and I watched people who were buying Empire Kosher chicken. And I would ask them if they were Jewish, and if they weren't Jewish, I asked them why they were buying it. Every single person said to me, it's better, isn't it? So that was interesting. Um, other people who are regular kosher consumers are people who buy, it for, buy kosher food for dietary reasons. They might be vegetarians who look for the kosher label that says D for dairy, and that means there's absolutely no meat product. Uh, they could be looking for the kosher label that says P for parv, neutral. That means the product has absolutely no meat or dairy. If you're not a very strict vegan, you might look for that label because it has no meat or dairy, but it could, also, it could have honey or eggs, which a strict vegan would not want. Dietary reasons. If you're lactose intolerant, 30 to 50 million Americans are lactose intolerant. 90% of Asian Americans are lactose intolerant, as are 75% of African Americans. And they would look for a kosher label without the D, without the dairy. Because a kosher label that does not say dairy has absolutely, not only does it have no dairy in the product, no dairy ingredients were, came anywhere near the assembly line where that product was made. And I watched, um, I, I talked to Asian women who are in supermarkets looking for kosher food to buy for their families just for that reason. There are other religious reasons than Jewish observance for buying kosher food. 
Seventh-day Adventists, Seventh-day Baptists, and certain of the other fundamentalist Christian groups follow the Old Testament's, their Old Testament's prohibition on unclean animals. So they will buy kosher meat, knowing that it's from a clean animal. And many Muslims will buy kosher meat uh, when they can't get halal, which is Muslim certified meat. It's a misnomer to think that Muslims will eat kosher meat because it's the same. It's not the same. It's close. And in areas where halal meat is not prevalent, their imams will give them dispensation, but only until they can find halal meat. So as halal meat is becoming more and more um, ubiquitous in this country, fewer Muslims will eat kosher meat. For now, they're still a big part of the kosher meat market. So you can see there's many different reasons uh, why people would buy kosher food. Uh, very, very quickly, for those of you who don't know the laws of kashrut, uh, it's explained online. You can go, you can, uh, go, go to different Jewish uh, websites and look for it. But it, kosher food is not food that's blessed by a rabbi. That's the first thing to get rid of. And um, kashrut, which is a word that I use in my talk, is um, the entire network of laws and traditions that govern traditional Jewish dietary practice. The word kosher comes from the Hebrew kasher, fit or proper. And interestingly, uh, that word never appears in the Torah itself. In later books, it does. The book of Esther, I think, uses the word kasher, to, um, but not in relation to food. Again, in relation to fit or proper, which is kind of the way we use kosher in American English today, right? So uh, keeping kosher is one thing, but the business of kosher certification is something different. The business of kosher certification is a 20th century invention that's tied to the rise of the industrial age in the 19th century and the increasing prevalence in the early 20th century of factory processed foods. You don't need a rabbi or anybody else to tell you that an apple is kosher. It's kosher, you can eat it. At the turn of the last century, the overwhelming majority of the food that typical Americans ate was bought in bulk in its raw form, and you prepared everything at home. So observant Jews were only concerned that they should buy meat from a kosher butcher and that they should buy kosher wine. Other than that, they made all their food at home. But as soon as you take that apple and you cut it or you chop it and you cook it and you begin to make it into applesauce and you can it and you add preservatives to it, then how can you know if you buy a jar of applesauce from a factory and you look at the list of ingredients, and most of them aren't even food, the ingredients are all chemicals, you don't know what the heck they are, how is a person supposed to know whether the ingredients are kosher or not? And this is the situation that confronted more and more observant Jews through the 19-teens, through the 1920s, they were bringing these new canned and boxed and packaged products to their poor pulpit rabbi and saying, Rabbi, is this cereal kosher? Is this you know, juice kosher? And the pulpit rabbi would look at the same list of chemicals and not know what to do. So in 1923, the Orthodox Union, which is the National Association of Orthodox Synagogues, decided they had to bring order to factory processed kosher food and they, they came up with this notion of creating a label that would, could be slapped on a processed food product and indicate to anyone around the world that this product is kosher certified by a national board so that you wouldn't have to take each individual product, each individual food item to your poor congregational rabbi. This was a new notion that was taking the responsibility for kosher authorization from the local level and making it national and eventually international authority. It was a new concept. It took the Orthodox Union, the OU, about a year to find a company that would um, cotton to their newfangled notion. Heinz was the first company in 1923. The very first kosher certified product was Heinz vegetarian beans. They took their old pork and beans recipe and made it kosher. Uh, and it took months for the OU and Heinz to work out what the kosher label was going to look like on the can. The original idea was um, this huge word kosher all over the can, and Heinz panicked. They said, we don't want anything that Jewish. We don't want to scare away our Gentile customers. So they went back and forth for a long time and came up with the U in a circle, which really means O, Orthodox Union, 
Non-Jews still today would look at the can and not know that a U in a circle means that it's kosher, but it was a signal to observant Jews around the country and today around the world that the product was indeed kosher. So through the 1920s and 30s and 40s, up until the 1980s, it was relatively difficult to get food manufacturers in this country to accept kosher certification. But the tipping point was reached some, at some point in the 1980s, and today, as I said, up to 40% of all the food products in the typical American supermarket are kosher certified. It's almost impossible to launch a new food product in this country if you don't have kosher certification, and that's because of the distribution mechanism. Um, but, but what's interesting is that is only true in America, where food manufacturers consider the kosher label a mark of quality. In many other countries around the world, the kosher label is still seen as standoffish and a Jewish niche product. In England, for example, uh, supermarkets will not carry uh, food with a kosher label. So American companies that ship to England that are already kosher have to take the kosher label off. And the London Beit Dean, the Board of Rabbis of London, every year puts out something called the Kosher Nosh Guide. It's a booklet that changes, and you can get it online as well, and it lists by product name and ingredient, what you can buy and what you can't buy. And you can watch um, Orthodox Jews walking around the supermarket with this booklet, you know, looking at, because there's no labels. So again, it, the kosher label is a mark of quality in North America. I spent a year on the kosher food trail following mashkiachs, who are the men and women who are the kosher supervisors, as they did their work in factories and slaughterhouses. I was in way too many slaughterhouses doing this book, and um, industrial kitchens. I, I love the insides of mechanisms, behind the scenes, how things work out. I went to, um, I mentioned Tropicana earlier. I went to the Tropicana orange juice factory in Bradenton, Florida, one February, to watch them kosher the entire factory for Passover. Tropicana is one of the many drink companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, that comes out with special kosher for Passover drinks over, for the Passover holiday where they replace all the high fructose corn syrup because Ashkenazi Jews cannot eat corn over Passover. They replace it with delicious cane sugar, which was the original recipe, and that's why so many people wait for the kosher for Passover Coca-Cola with the special yellow tip. Uh, the yellow cap that comes out uh, every March, and usually it's on sale for three to five weeks, depending on how quickly it sells out. Tastes delicious. So I went to Tropicana Orange Juice, does it to their orange juice as well, and for 12 hours in the middle of the night, they shut down their entire factory and run boiling water through these 100,000 gallon stainless steel tanks and rabbis go with blow torches into all of the ovens where they're cooking the, the oranges and a scrubbing with caustic acid up and down all the rubber conveyor belts. It was like something out of a Hieronymus Bosch painting inside this huge cavernous factory with boiling water dripping from the ceilings and flames coming up from below and little guys running back and forth on ladders. It was just, I love factories, number one. And all the really cool work of Kashrut goes on in the middle of the night in these factories. And imagine what Tropicana is losing in revenue by shutting down their entire operation for 12 hours just to make this product that is only for sale for three to five weeks. Obviously, they're making money on it. My most delicious adventure, factory-wise, was when I went to the haagen factory near Bakersfield, California. And uh, that day that I went, they were making, yes, haagen is kosher, they were making um, chocolate-covered toffee crunch ice cream popsicles. Mm. So you walk in the front door, and first of all, you smell the, the molten chocolate and the toasted almonds. And you see this scene out of the Willy Wonka chocolate factory of thousands of tiny little popsicles on the assembly line running around and vats of molten chocolate poured down on top of them. Now, the, the rabbi who is the mashkiach, who is the kosher supervisor in the haagen factory, Rabbi Kaplan, he's been doing that for 11, 12 years now. He's a Lubavitcher. And that means his standard of dairy is called Cholof Yisrael. It's an ultra-Orthodox uh, kosher standard, not typical kosher milk. So he has never tasted Haagen-Dazs ice cream.
Now to me, the self-discipline required to work in a factory like that and never eat the stuff shows the level of commitment that this particular mashkiach had in his work. Um, you don't have to be a rabbi to be, uh, to be a mashkiach. You have to be an observant Jew, men or women. And as time goes by and as the kosher food industry is growing by leaps and bounds, more and more women are becoming mashkichot. And this is really hard work. And particularly if you're working in factories, you're on the road, you're away from your family, uh, it's physical, you have to be climbing on top of boxes and looking in to see if, the, if, if, if things match up. So it, re it really is incredible to think of the effort involved in producing kosher food around the world. I went to China. I went to China where there are more than 2,000 factories producing kosher food and kosher food ingredient, all of it for export to the United States, Canada, and Israel. Half of all the food exported from China today is kosher certified. Think about that. Most of it is chemicals, flavorings, additives. You'll, I visited one factory near Shanghai, about three hours out of Shanghai, a huge Danish-built plant that had thousands of workers, and all they made was one chemical that went into a preservative that was used in a corn oil product made in North America. Now, um, it's just... It's just unbelievable. The global as food production itself has become globalized. And as you have, say, a can of chicken soup that could have 23 ingredients on the label, as I mentioned, only the first four or five are recognizable food products, each one of those ingredients could be made in a different factory in a different country, which means each one of those factories, no matter where they are around the world, needs kosher supervision. So the whole thing snowballed starting in the 1980s where the major food manufacturers would get kosher supervision and that meant all of, their, all of the plants and companies they dealt with that made their ingredients, that made their labels, that made the equipment upon which their food was going to be made, all of that had to get kosher supervision. Now when you have an industry that big involving that amount of money there's tremendous temptation for corruption and for fraud. And indeed, unfortunately, the kosher food industry is no stranger to that, just like the food industry in general. But because the kosher food industry has such strict laws, uh, there is greater temptation and greater possibility for this kind of fraud. There, the four major kosher, super, uh, kosher certification agencies in this country, there are four of them, who together certify about 80 to 85 percent of all the kosher food. Those four major agencies all have huge fraud departments and they're all lawyered up and they spend all their time looking for companies that are using their label fraudulently. Sometimes the fraud is innocent. One of my favorite stories took place about 15, 20 years ago. A rabbi from the Orthodox Union was buying film for his camera. Remember the olden days when we used to have film in our cameras? And he picked up a package of Fuji film and saw an OU kosher label on it, on the film. He said, so I, you know, I know that we certify aluminum foil and sponges used in the kitchen, but film? No. So the head of the OU kosher department called the CEO of Fuji Film in Japan, said, what is this? We don't certify you. Why are you using our label? And it turned out it had been a marketing decision. Fuji Japan, their marketers, found out that products with this little OU symbol sell better in America. As soon as, they figured, as soon as they were told what it meant, they took the label off. And now, sometimes fraud is not as innocent, and the cases aren't settled as easily. Uh, another rabbi told me about the pizza parlor, that, the kosher pizza parlor that he certified in uh, New Jersey. And he would go once a week, do a spot check, just show up unannounced and make sure everything was fine, never had a problem. He'd been certifying it for years. And they kept a freezer filled with the kosher cheese that they used in the pizza. He would look and make sure it was there. One day he was visiting and he was walking up a stairwell to the upstairs office with the owner of the restaurant when he looked underneath the stairwell and saw a big black garbage bag. The mashkiachs love to look through the garbage. That's where you find all the really good dirt on a company. So the rabbi looked down and he said, so what's in the garbage bag? And the owner of the restaurant looked at the garbage bag, ran down the stairs, grabbed it, and took off down the street. 
with the guard. And he ran for three or four blocks with the rabbi running after him. This is a true story. Rabbi Luban told this to me. And finally, the owner of the restaurant threw the garbage bag under a huge trailer truck and disappeared. So rabbi, he's not a young man. He's crawling under the trailer truck. He gets out the garbage bag. What's it filled with? Empty boxes of non-kosher cheese. Now, what was the owner of this restaurant doing? He was sneaking into his own restaurant in the middle of the night. I told you all the really interesting work of Kashrut happens in the middle of the night, the good and the bad and the trafe. He was sneaking into his own restaurant, bringing in non-kosher cheese, because it's cheaper than kosher cheese, and grating it up and putting it in bowls for his workers to use the next day. Whenever you go into a pizza parlor, there's always a bowl of pre-grated cheese. So when you say, can I have some more cheese on my slice, they throw it on. So he was doing this, and he was only saving maybe $900 to $1,000 a month. But it was worth it to him because he was such a small operation. And what about all the packages of kosher cheese in the freezer? They were out of date. They were years old. It was a Potemkin freezer of kosher cheese. It had never been used. So uh, he lost his kosher certification, and he never got it back. Now you can say, if you're not a kosher observant Jew, or even if you are and you don't know, you know, what's the harm? So it was non-kosher cheese, big deal. The entire system of kosher certification is based on trust. You don't have a kosher supervisor looming over a chef 24-7 in the restaurant. They depend upon trust and they depend upon spot checks, trust but verify. And once you've broken that trust, the entire system can collapse. Now the biggest uh, temptation for fraud and corruption is the kosher meat industry. Just like the meat industry in general, these jobs are low paid, it's a dirty business, it's a secret business, nobody wants to know what goes on behind those closed doors, and I can tell you it was not pleasant to witness, and I went through a handful of slaughterhouses and spent some time in them. Um, many of us have read two years ago about agriprocessors, which used to be the largest kosher slaughterhouse in America. It produced 60% of the kosher meat in this country at the time it was shut down in May of 2008 following an immigration raid. That case pales in comparison to what was going on in the kosher meat industry a century, a century ago in the early part of the 20th century when rabbis in New York were locking each other in meat freezers and assassinating each other on the streets for the pleasure of controlling kosher certification of meat in their neighborhood. In the 1890s, there were the, um, the meat wars of Brownsville in New York where you know, rabbis were getting into fisticuff fights in the streets over who controlled which neighborhood. In 1902, in New York City, there were 1,500 kosher butchers in New York City alone. Something like half of all the meat that was produced in New York City in the by the 1920s was kosher. So back to 1902, there are 1,500 kosher butchers in the city. One night in May, they all raised the price of their kosher beef from 12 cents a pound to 18 cents a pound overnight. The next day, 20,000 Jewish women took to the streets of the Lower East Side, Harlem and the Bronx, the biggest Jewish neighborhoods at the time, and boycotted those kosher butchers, rioted outside their stores, broke windows, set fire to the butcher shops, attacked patrons who were buying the meat, who were walking out of the stores, grabbing the meat out of their hands, throwing it in the gutter. The NYPD was called out. There were truncheons involved. There were fist fights in the street. Hundreds of Jewish women were carted away in paddy wagons, and they were all fined one dollar, which was a lot of money at the time. Two weeks later, the kosher butchers in New York City rolled back their prices. The women won. It happened again, 1905, happened again, 1907, 1916, in Boston, in Chicago, in Philadelphia, in New York, in each, the biggest one was 1935, when the Jewish women of New York City again shut down the entire kosher meat industry in the city for something like six or seven weeks, just shut it down completely. And in each instance, the butchers backed down and rolled back the prices. So you can see just the intensity of involvement of, of Jewish people in the kosher meat uh, industry. As late as 1961, another case, there was uh, a rabbi from St. Paul, Rabbi Morris Katz, 
who was empowered by the Rabbinical Council of the Midwest to investigate the situation of kosher meat processing plants in the Midwest. There was a suspicion that who knew what was really being ground up and put into these meat products? Salamis and hot dogs and delis and cold cuts. So he spent three years investigating this Rabbi Katz. And he, he um, would camp out outside kosher meat packing plants on Friday night when the kosher supervisor wasn't working and he would wait to see what would happen. And the first time he did that, he saw a van pull up and, to the landing dock and start unloading non-kosher sides of beef from the non-kosher slaughterhouse the same company owned 25 miles away. Again, it's cheaper to grind up the non-kosher meat and make it into the kosher sausages. When he was done with his study, which took seven years before he published his monograph, and it came out in the early 1960s, he estimated that 85% of the kosher meat product being sold in this country was indeed completely trafe, not kosher at all. It's all it was all about money. So you can see that um, it, I, I would put it to you that it's much more difficult today to perpetrate that kind of fraud because we have instant communication, right? <laughs> Cell phones you can pick up, the security systems are much more high tech. Just accessibility of information today makes it much more difficult to engage in those kinds of behaviors. So if Jewish dietary practice has affected the American food industry, so has the American experience affected Judaism and affected how Jews practice kashrut. American Jews have always been engaged in a very delicate balancing act, like every immigrant group in this country, between wanting to be fully American, fully assimilated, and yet at the same time express our ethnic identity. Be Jewish. How can you do both of them? At the turn of the last century, the time when my grandmother came and a lot of our relatives, that was the uh, influx, the largest mass influx of Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe and the former Pale of Settlement in the Russian Empire. And m more than a million Jews came into this country during those years. They wanted to be American as quickly as possible and not be outed as greenhorns. At the turn of the last century, there were very few Jews in America who kept kosher. They wanted to be American, and if you kept kosher, you couldn't have dinner with your business partner, and you couldn't have lunch with the ladies for, brid for, brudge, for bridge, and your children were segregated in the schools because they weren't eating on the meal program. The way to get ahead was to take off the yarmulke and stop eating kosher, and that was, ve that was really the trend in American Jewish life before the First World War. Now, by the time the first generation their children were born after the First World War into the 20s. Jews were feeling a little bit more comfortable in their American identity and came up with the idea of the kosher style deli. Now this is a very interesting thing because it's very, very Jewish, even as it does not adhere to the laws, to the strict laws of kashrut. What's kosher style? It's Jewish food. They want their briskets and they want their latkes and they want their egg cream. And they, and they want to go to a deli where they can be with other Jewish people and enjoy Jewish food. But maybe it's not so observant. And maybe it's open on the Sabbath. And maybe you're ordering some beef. And if you want cheese, maybe the waitress will come and bring it to you. And you can put it on yourself if you want. As the decades passed, the cheese and the meat that were ordered separately started to appear in the same dishes. And it's interesting, today, the uh, kosher style deli menu is almost iconic. And very often you will see meat dishes on one side of the menu and dairy dishes on the other side of the menu as if, right? It's kosher style. Now today you won't see the word kosher style on most of these delis. They'll be called New York delis. That's the code word for kosher-ish, right? Um, by the time of the second generation in this country, into the 1930s, there was a new way of Jewish eating that was called eating out. If you ask a Jew if they eat out, we know what they mean. It means you keep a kosher kitchen at home, Jewish identity in the home, and then outside the home you may or may not observe kashrut. And this was a generation through the 1930s and the Second World War that was becoming very strong in its American identity, but still uh, had to 
get along with the non-Jewish working world, getting ahead in the professions, getting ahead in the business world, and getting ahead on college campuses meant eating with non-Jewish friends and colleagues. That was the thinking. So eating out became uh, a Jewish practice among Orthodox Jews as well in those years. Today, it's very unusual for Orthodox Jews to eat out in a non-kosher restaurant, whereas their parents 30, 40 years ago might have been comfortable eating in a non-kosher restaurant and ordering the salad, or maybe if they were adventurous, the fish. Today, very few Orthodox Jews will do that. It was really about 25 years ago, the last, this past generation, that there's been a big revival of interest among American Jews in Jewish dietary practice. Over the last 25 years, the Orthodox world has become more strict in its kosher practice. And the Reform world, for example, Reform Judaism, which was founded on a platform 150 years ago of rejecting kashrut, of rejecting all the traditional Jewish dietary and dress traditions as being out of step with modernity. The Reform movement today has been, re, has been rediscovering and re-examining every Jewish ritual from uh, wearing yarmulkes to mikvah, the ritual bath, and now to kashrut, Jewish dietary practice, and mining these Jewish rituals for their spiritual potential. It's very, very interesting. The young generation of non-observant Jews, of liberal Jews in this country, are so comfortable in their American identity that they don't feel threatened by an examination of kashrut in the way their grandparents might have felt threatened. It no longer means that you're an isolated Orthodox Jew with the side curls and the hat and you have to live in a particular neighborhood. Today, any altering your dietary practice for any moral or health or political reason is no longer seen as outlandish, but it's celebrated. It's laudatory. If you're sitting, if you're invited to a dinner party, how often will the host or hostess say, so what can you eat, what can you not eat? You're vegetarian, good for you, I wish I were. You keep kosher, good for you, I can't do it, I'm not disciplined enough, right? So keeping kashrut as a form of moral, spiritual, and ethnic identity is, uh, is something that is looked up to rather than looked down upon. And we also see today uh, Jews taking uh, kosher food upon themselves at certain occasions as a mark of membership in, a in the tribe, as a signal of belonging to the Jewish people. So you see entirely non-observant Jews at their bar or bat mitzvah or at their wedding, it's kosher catered. They don't keep kosher at home, but of course the event is going to be kosher catered because we are celebrating the fact that we're Jewish people and the way we do it is by having a kosher event. And that is also recent. As late as the 1950s and 60s, even into the 1970s, most national conventions of Jewish organizations, including the Jewish Federation system into the 1960s in this country, did not serve kosher food or have a kosher option at its national gatherings. You had to bring your own food into the early 19, as late as the 1960s to, this Jewish, to national Jewish conferences. That is no longer true today. The, in the last two years, that's really the biggest change that has happened in how American Jews look at Jewish dietary practice. And that has a lot to do with the agriprocessor scandal. When this kosher slaughterhouse was shut down for the illegal for employment of underage workers, employment of illegal aliens. There were allegations of uh, inhumane treatment of the animals. That was never proved. The CEO of the company, who's presently serving a very lengthy prison system, was convicted on financial fraud and money laundering. And it really caused the entire Jewish community to take a hard look at itself and saying, if this is our food, food being produced in our name, we want to be proud of it. And, oh, and again, over the last two years, the, the conversation over what does it mean to create and eat food that is fit and proper for us, what does that mean? Should we expand our definition of kashrut, of kosher food, to include other ethical concerns that the Torah 
commands us to observe. There are Jewish uh, commandments to treat domestic animals humanely. There are Torah commandments to treat your workers fairly. According to the Torah, you must pay your workers wages by, the, by sundown every day. Wouldn't that be nice if that happened in our world today? There's a Torah commandment to be a steward of the earth. There's a Torah commandment that you must take care of your physical body. You must respect your body and not put bad things into it. So these are all separate Jewish ethics. And there has been a huge conversation going on, as I said, across the Jewish denominational spectrum, Reform, Conservative, Reconstructionist, and Orthodox, about whether or not to merge these concerns. In the Orthodox community, the tendency has been to keep them separate but equally stringently observed. And indeed, the Rabbinical Council of America, which is the Association of Orthodox Rabbis, at the beginning of this year issued a resolution saying they would no longer certify as kosher any food manufacturing company that, broke the, that did not observe local, state, or federal laws concerning workers' rights. And that's a beginning step. It's not yet, but it's, it's a beginning realization that if we want to be proud of the food that we are producing in the name of the Jewish people, perhaps there should be other things that are going into consideration than just how the animal is being slaughtered. Um, Jews are not the only people with a tradition of sacred eating. Many other cultures have their own sacred dietary practice. But ours is the oldest to have survived into the modern world, relatively unchanged. We have laws governing how we plant our food, how we harvest it. We have laws concerning how we slaughter animals, how we produce our food, how we prepare it, how we cook it, how we eat it, the blessings that we say before and after. It's as if Jews are hardwired to link their food choices to other moral, political, and spiritual concerns. I don't think it's any coincidence that so many Jews have been active in the vegetarian movement, in the organic movement, in the slow food and the locavore movements. We are a people who understand that what we put into our mouth has a lot to say about who we are and the values that we hold dear. And the conversation about Jewish dietary practice has never been more active than it is today in America. Thank you. The second question is the easier one. There are, I think it's something like 11 or 12 countries now. Uh, the, que the second question was to discuss countries where shechita, which is kosher slaughter, has been banned. There are 11 or 12 countries where the, the ban has either gone through or has been narrowly defeated and will be brought up again. So I think there are about eight or nine countries where kosher slaughter is now banned and halal slaughter is also, is also banned and it's on grounds of uh, humane treatment of animals. At the time that kosher slaughter was, uh, was invented, uh, more than 2,000 years ago, it was the idea of a quick cut across the neck by a very, very sharp knife wielded by a person who was highly trained to do it was certainly more humane than the alternative way that animals were slaughtered. And even today, field slaughters in farms where an animal is hung up and it's, kosher slaughter seems to be a much more humane method than that. But in the industrial slaughterhouse of today where animals are killed by um, a steel bolt quickly into the brain, there is some argument that that is a quicker death. So on those grounds, there are certain countries that have banned both halal and kosher slaughter. Now, if you believe that that's the only reason why the slaughter was banned in those countries, um, that's something else. And you might take as an indication the fact that kosher slaughter was banned in Germany in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the politics of kashrus, yes, lots of fun. Um, I mentioned that there are four major kosher certification agencies that certify 80 to 85 percent of all the kosher food in this country. But there are more than 1,000 separate 
kosher agencies and individuals giving certification in this country. More than a thousand, each of which has his or her own little label that says, this certifies it as kosher according to Rabbi X, you know, who lives down the block in Williamsburg. Now the politics. The big four kosher agencies will not steal clients from each other, certainly not openly, and they have a gentleman's agreement among themselves to play nice. But when you get into the little neighborhoods, particularly the Hasidic neighborhoods of Brooklyn and of Pittsburgh and of Montreal and of Miami and of Los Angeles, where every corner shtiebel has a different Hasidic Rebbe and his followers will only accept bread that he himself has blessed in his own special way, that's where you really get into the politics. And there are even entire communities, Lubavitcher Hasidim, who are tens of thousands of people, will not eat meat that is slaughtered by Sethmars. And the Satmar Hasidim won't eat meat that's slaughtered by the Lubavitchers, because the Lubavitchers might believe that the Rebbe was the Messiah. And this is a religious shame, it's a Shanda, and we won. So yes, there's, and I didn't get into the politics of it too much, because that's its own separate book. I alluded to it, but yeah, there's a lot of that going on. Am I saying that the four major kashrut agencies are basically kosher? They, um, they play nice with each other, yes. If one company that is under certification from one of the big four says they want to go to, a, to, to one of the competitors because it's less expensive or because they're friendlier with it, that's not acceptable. And the competitor will not take away somebody else's big client. Now, that doesn't mean that a new company that doesn't have kosher certification yet isn't going to get phone calls from all four agencies trying to say why they're... It, but that's standard business procedure. They're not engaging in the kinds of shenanigans you're going to find in the corner stables. I'm wondering if you can shed a little more light on the uh, inevitable progress of the more humane kosher, the kosher with ethical leanings, and, and since you're deeply into all the kosher, where you, what you see happening with that? Yes. Um, there's something called the New Jewish Food Movement, which was given a name just about four years ago by a man named Nigel Savage, who's a friend of mine, who's the executive director of an organization called Hazon, H-A-Z-O-N. The New Jewish Food Movement, which is uh, a loose-knit group of several thousand, mostly younger Jews, some of whom are farmers, some of whom are educators, some of whom are rabbis or rabbinical students, and some of whom are just ordinary people who are interested in the politics and morality of food production in this country in general. Just as the new food movement in this country has um, moved from its initial roots in organic agriculture and pesticide-free agriculture of the 70s and 80s to its present focus on uh, locally produced uh, food, farmers markets, supporting your local producers, reducing your carbon footprint, free range chickens, beef that is humanely uh, raised. Anyone who's read Michael Pollan's books, The Omnivore's Dilemma, The Botany of Desire knows what I'm talking about. Michael Pollan is the guru of the new Jewish food movement as well. So uh, many younger Jews who are not involved in Judaism, um, not observant Jews, have come into the new Jewish food movement through their involvement in food politics. And as I said, about four years ago, this movement coalesced. Five years ago was the first new Jewish food conference. It's now held every December, um, either in the West Coast or the East Coast. Anyone who's interested in that can go to hazone.org and, and learn about it. And this is a generation of young Jews who say, we want to be proud of the food that we produce in our name. And there are a handful of them who've gone into the kosher, the humane kosher meat business. Now, what does this mean? I've met all these people. These are not butchers or farmers. One of them is a librarian from Silver Spring, Maryland. One of them is a pediatrician in the Bronx. There's another horticulture student who's, who's started one of these operations. And they're finding farmers who grow animals grass-fed, not, not, the animal has a, has a very happy life until it's killed and then we get to eat it. 
Um, and, but paying attention to the quality of the animal's life, doing it mindfully, making sure it's organic, making sure it's coming locally, and then selling this meat, this kosher certified meat, back to people. It's expensive. It's about two and a half to three times ex as expensive as non-kosher meat and about twice as expensive as kosher meat. And the idea behind that is maybe meat should be expensive and maybe we shouldn't eat as much of it and we shouldn't eat it unthinkingly and maybe it should be for special occasions. So that's sort of the story. There are now four um, small-scale independent humane kosher meat operations in existence uh, in this country. And another one is about to open in Berkeley, and they're starting slowly. You were asked about different, uh, different types of uh, kashrut. Uh, could you s shed any light on glot kosher? And uh, I, I'm always amused when I travel on El Al and all the food that they serve is kosher, and someone sitting next to me and they know I'm a rabbi, you know, don't, don't you want the glot kosher? Because that's the real kosher meal. And I said, no, the kosher's, kosher's just fine for me. But uh, could you shed a little light on, on that distinction? I mentioned that as the entire Jewish population has become more interested in kashrus, the Orthodox world has become stricter in its practice. And that includes the march towards glot which, um, what is glot kosher? Glot kosher just means that the lungs of the animal, which have to be examined after slaughter, are completely smooth. The word glot means smooth. And because sick animal, diseased animals, are not allowed to be slaughtered for kosher food, the notion of glot is that if the animal had had certain respiratory illnesses, they would show up as scarring, as little adhesions on the lungs. Now, this glot uh, tradition came from Hungary, came from the Satmar Hasidim of Hungary, and really came to this country in 1956, after the Hungarian Revolution, when the bulk of the Satmar Hasidim uh, left Hungary for the United States. And it remained within the Hasidic community through the 50s and 60s, 70s, by the 80s. Today, it has really become the standard of, of kosher meat. None of the big four kosher agencies will certify a slaughterhouse or a meatpacking operation that is not glat. Uh, it's, it's complicated to explain why it's not worth their while economically to do so. Uh, Hebrew National, the gentleman said before, it's ironic, the company that made its reputation on We Answer to a Higher Authority, which is still today the largest producer of kosher processed meats and of hot dogs in the world, uh, Orthodox Jews will in general not eat it. And until five years ago, conservative Jews wouldn't eat Hebrew National either. Why? The, the supervisor, the kosher supervisor, the mashkiach for the company was paid by the company. And he didn't live, he lived in New York and all the company's plants are in the Midwest. And the thought was, how could he be impartial and what kind of supervisor is he if he's getting his salary from the company that pays his bill? So nobody accepted, no, nobody. The observant Jewish community did not accept his kosher standards. He died five years ago, and now the company is under the kosher certification of the Triangle K, who is, which is led by Rabbi Arye Ralbag, a young Israel rabbi, also in Brooklyn. And the conservative movement in 2005 sent a team of rabbis to investigate whether Hebrew National was kosher enough yet. And they took Rabbi Ralbag on a tour of all the slaughterhouses and packing plants used by the company, and they quizzed him. And in June of that year, they said, yes, uh, Hebrew National meats are kosher according to conservative standards. The Orthodox Union has not done the same. So that's the story of Hebrew National. The acceptance of kashrut now as a food choice would be, uh, have to do with Jews uh, comfort as Americans. Would you say there's any other factors or is that the main factor you see in terms of why kashrut becomes acceptable for the more liberal strains of Judaism? Well, uh, there are uh, th about three factors. Number one is comfort level with being Americans. It's fine to say you keep to a certain diet. Number two, the increased religiosity of American society in general over the last generation. Uh, you know, people talk about 
synagogue membership is down and church attendance is dwindling, but more Americans today believe in God and are looking for spiritual nourishment than at any time in history. America is, has always been religious and is becoming more religious. So the liberal traditions within Judaism have been looking to revamp their prayer. I mean, the reform movement looking at prayer not as words you say from a book and stand up and sit down because the book tells you to, but that you should be praying. If you're going to bother to come to synagogue, you should pray words that mean something to you, right? So the whole examination of our rituals and how they can enrich our life and not just give a, um, you know, an aesthetic facade to our life is, is very big in a reform Judaism in particular. And the last thing has to do with the strength of ethnic identity beginning in the 1970s in this country. We no longer wanted to be a melting pot, we wanted to be a mosaic. And my grandmother would always say she was an American, and I say I'm a Jew, right? And then, and, and then I'm an American. So the idea of ethnic identity being strong in this country is something that has affected the reform movement. Next month, the reform movement is publishing its first book ever on Jewish dietary practice. I reviewed it last week. It's called The Sacred Table. And the very first word in the book is kosher. So they're not afraid of the K word. And it's not promoting kashrut and saying you must observe kashrut. It's saying this is a... Um, this is a Jewish tradition that has deep spiritual significance that you would do well to examine deeply, and here's how you can do it. So that's interesting. <laughs>